All right, Luke chapter number one. Luke chapter number one. And uh, we'll start reading in verse 46. We got down through verse 48 last time. And uh, we'll look here again at Mary and the scene here of the birth of John the Baptist and the, the conception of the Lord Jesus Christ with Mary. Verse 46, And Mary said, My soul doth magnify, uh, that is to praise the Lord. And uh, we looked at that. Then Mary goes on here and says, My spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. And again, that answers the, the, old, the adage of Mary and the fact that she understood that uh, she needed a Savior as well. So she says, My soul doth magnify the Lord. My spirit hath rejoiced in God. So there's her soul and her spirit. And then in verse 48, she has... For he hath regarded the low estate of his handmaiden. For behold, from hence all generations shall call me blessed. There's her body, and really a wonderful way to be. They are going to call me blessed. And when she does that, now in the rest of this section here down to verse 56, Mary is literally going to quote the Old Testament. Uh, if you come back to Malachi chapter 3, uh, when she says there, going to call me blessed. And I'll remind you, Mary was completely committed, totally committed to what was going on. She didn't argue with Gabriel. She just said, let it be, let it be so. And she did that because she understood where uh, she was at in the scriptures, uh, Malachi 3. And if you look here at verse 12, Malachi 3, verse 12, and all nations shall call you Blessed, for ye shall be a delightful some land, saith the Lord of hosts. When the, talking about Israel and then calling Israel blessed, and Mary is often referred to as woman. The Lord actually will say, Woman, what do I have to do with it? And not in a derogatory manner, but rather in an, in an, in an understanding that Mary represents the nation of Israel in the pictures. So when you come back to Luke 1, and she says that, you know, they call me blessed. So here's Mary called blessed. Here's Israel called blessed. And really that blessed, um, if you look back at Zechariah 8, so right before Malachi, I guess, should have had you look move before you left. If you look at Zechariah 8 and verse 13, talking about Israel, he says, and it shall come to pass that as ye were a curse among the heathen, O house of Judah and house of Israel, so will I save you, and ye shall be a blessing. Fear not, but let your hands be strong. Now, if you look right across the page to verse 23, so you start in verse 20, there's Acts 2. Verse 23, we've moved into the millennial kingdom. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, In those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold out of all languages of the nations. Now that's going to be Matthew 28. Even, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, We will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. So again, that Abrahamic covenant in the kingdom, in Jerusalem, and they're going to call Israel blessed. So when you come back to Luke 1, that issue here of calling me blessed, yes, Mary herself, but also Mary as in the picture of Israel bringing forth the Messiah, bringing the Messiah out, putting him on display, and there he is. So then she says in verse 49, For he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name. Now, that's going to be a quote out of Psalms. So we're going to hold on to Luke 1 and go back to Psalms. Uh, first of all, go back to Psalms 116, uh, just so you see this issue here, that what Mary is doing is she is answering the prophetic scriptures. She's using them. If you look at Psalms 116 and verse 16, O Lord, truly I am thy servant, I am thy servant, and the son of thine handmaiden. Thou hast loosed my bonds. Well, in Luke 1, 48, what is she? 
the low estate of his handmaiden. Now, verse 49, going to call holy is his name. If holy is his name, hallowed be thy name. Matthew 6, you're in Psalms. Look at Psalms 111. Going a little quicker because there's quite a bit of this I'd like you to see. So as you understand, if Mary, what did you know? We sing that song. Well, she actually knew quite a bit. Can you get the door for Jeff? I didn't unlock it. Psalms 111, if you will. Just pop it loose so he can get it. Psalms 111. And the issue here, hallowed be thy, holy is his name. And the issue there, again, is this reference to the kingdom and what Mary's doing here. Uh, Psalms 111, verse 1. Psalms 111, verse 1. Praise ye the Lord. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright and in the congregation. So we're looking out into the future. Verse 2. The works of the Lord are great, sought out of all them that have pleasure therein. Verse 9. He sent redemption unto his people. He hath commanded his covenant forever. Holy and reverend is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and a good understanding. Have all they that do his commandments, his praise endureth forever. So again, the issue, coming back here into Luke 1, hold on to Psalms, is he says, For he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name. She instantly pulls back into this issue of who this young child's going to be, who this babe in her womb is going to be, and he's going to be holy and reverend. He's going to be the Savior, the Redeemer of Israel. There he is. So when you come back now to Psalms, or I'm sorry, Luke 1, verse 50, and his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. He hath showed strength with his arm. He hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He hath put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. He hath filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he hath sent empty away. And, and again, what she's going to quote now, so go back to Psalms 103. And, and I'm just doing this so that uh, you see that what Mary knew. Mary wasn't just this, you know, little soft-spoken little lady over here. She literally is going to quote the Old Testament here in this adoration where she says, My soul doth magnify the Lord. And she does it by quoting Scripture. So Luke 1, verse 50, if you look at Psalms 103, verse 17. Here's where she's at. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear Him, and His righteousness unto children's children. Verse 50, and His mercy is on them that fear Him from generation to generation. Then in Luke 1, verse 51, He that showed strength with His arm, He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. That's going to take us back to, uh, we'll hold on to Psalms or stick something in it, and run back to Exodus 15. Exodus 15. Now she's going to make an allurement back into the, the issues of the Exodus. And when Pharaoh is going to be dealt with, Exodus 15 Verse 1, Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord, and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord. By the way, that is what Mary's doing here. She is singing unto the Lord. And she, she says, For he uh, hath triumphed gloriously, the horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. Uh, by the way, that's a picture of Pharaoh. Well, it's Pharaoh in the moment, but it's a picture of the uh, Antichrist in the future. The Lord is my strength, verse 2, and song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will prepare him a habitation, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a 
man of war. The Lord is his name. And again, that's what Mary's doing. She's singing the song. Now look over at verse 6. Thy right hand, O Lord, is become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed in pieces the enemy. Down to verse 12. Thou stretchest out thy right hand. The earth swallowed them up. Swallowed them. Thou in thy mercy hast, uh, well, I just lost, hast led forth the people which thou hast redeemed. Thou hast guided them into thy, into thy, in thy strength unto thy holy habitation. That's what Mary's talking about. The one that I'm about to have is the one that's going to come in here and he's going he's to lead us to victory. The strength is in his right hand. When he says that, by the way, in verse 12, uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry, back up there in verse 16, thy right hand and so forth, he's talking about authority and power and strength. By the way, in Exodus 15, you run down uh, 9, 10, 11, there he's going to win the victory. He's gonna, he's gonna, uh, he's gonna get them. He's gonna uh, destroy the enemy, avenge them, and he's gonna set Israel in her place. So come back to Psalms 89. Psalms 89. Again, Mary is not just somebody that just was picked because she just happened to be walking by at the right time. She's picked because she's under. She's a Bible student. She's understanding where she's at in Israel's history. She's understanding the timeline of Daniel. She knows it's getting close. It's got to be getting close for the Messiah to come. And we know he's going to be born of a virgin. And we know that we, we, she's got all of this in her understanding. Psalms 89, if you <coughs> will look there at verse 10. Psalms 89 and verse 10. Thou hast broken Rahab in pieces. Isn't that an interesting thing? Rahab. Now this isn't the Rahab of uh, Rahab the harlot and helping the two spies. This is actually another name for Egypt. As one that is slain, thou hast scattered thine enemies with thy strong arm. There's the authority again. Verse 13. Thou hast a mighty arm. Strong is thy hand, and high is thy right hand. Justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. Mercy and truth shall go before thy face. This is a passage where we understand that in the kingdom, in the future, there's instant justice and judgment. There isn't a prolonged and protracted issue. He comes in, and he is done. Uh, if you come back to chapter, well, chapter 83... Just real quick here, chapter 83, if you look at verse 4, they have said, come and let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. That is the goal of the satanic policy of evil. That is Satan's uh, goal, to cut down no more Israel. Then you start in verse 5, for they have consulted together with one consent. They are confederate against thee the tabernacles of Edom. And then he lists from verse 6 down to verse 11 the ten confederate nations that are going to join the Antichrist in verse 15. So persecute them with thy temptest and make them afraid with thy storm. Fill their faces with shame that they may seek thy name, O Lord. Let them be confounded and troubled forever. Yea, let them be put to shame and perish, that the men may know that thou, whose name alone is Jehovah, art the Most High over all the earth. He's going to kill them, he's going to avenge them, and he's going to set in the place, holy is his name. And Mary, know, Mary understands that. That's why when you, again, hold on to Psalms, don't lose Psalms. When she says, blessed is his, holy is his name, look at what he's going to do. Here, This baby that I'm carrying He's the one that's going to come back now, and he's going to, one, be my Savior. So she knew she wasn't saved. She needed a Savior, a Redeemer. But yet she also knew he's fulfilling out the Old Testament 
uh, prophecies. Uh, down in verse 52. Verse 52, He hath put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. He hath filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he hath sent empty away. Uh, that's coming out of Psalms 107. Psalms 107. What he's going to do here. By the way, Psalms 107 begins the fifth book of Psalms. And the fifth book is that book that deals with the issue of the blesser. And uh, a wonderful thing there. Uh, Psalms 107, if you will look at verse 8. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for His goodness and for His wonderful works to the children of men. For He satisfy the longing soul and filleth the hungry soul with goodness. If you drop down, let your eye just run down to verse 40. He poureth contempt upon princes and causes them to wander in the wilderness where there is no way. Yet setteth he the poor on high from affliction and maketh him families like a flock. That's exactly what he's doing here. By the way, in verse 52 there, he put down the mighty... I'm sorry, I'm in Luke 1. Hold on to Psalms. We've got a couple more passages. He hath put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. If you come over to the book of Job, in Job 40, Job 40, Job 40, and if you look there, starting again in verse 9, Job 40, verse number 9, thou, Hast thou an arm like God, or canst thou thunder with a voice unto him? Now the Lord is talking to Job, and he's really talking about the tribulation period out there as it's going to come to an end. Okay, down in verse 15 we have, Behold now, behemoth, uh, that is behemoth, that, that composite being of Revelation 13, describing the beast, the Antichrist, and how he's going to be dealt with. Verse 10, Deck thyself now with majesty and excellency, and array thyself with glory and beauty. Cast abroad the rage of thy wrath, and behold every one that is proud, and abase him. Look on every one that is proud, and bring him low, and tread down the wicked in their place. And that's exactly what Mary says this child is going to do. So when you come back to Luke 1, verse 54, He hath hope in his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. Now, hope in, uh, to lay uh, to help, okay? Uh, that's going to be Psalms 98. So come on over there to Psalms 98. I know I'm going a little quickly, but I'd like to really finish the chapter. Um, with Q&A and stuff, we tend to be a long distance in between. I know on the videos are pretty close. But if you look there at Psalms 98, and if you look at verse 3, He hath remembered His mercy and His truth toward the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth hath seen the salvation of our God. He's remembered His mercy and His truth toward the house of Israel. What did He do? He opened His servant Israel in remembrance of His mercy. Luke 1, verse 55, He spake to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. You're in Psalms. That's going to be Psalm. If you turn the page to 105, Psalms 105, and you start in verse 8, He hath remembered His covenant forever, the word which He commanded to a thousand generations, which covenant He made with Abraham and His oath unto Isaac, and confirmed the same unto Jacob for a law, and to Israel for an everlasting covenant. It's a fascinating thing about that everlasting covenant connected to the earth and what's happening there. So then you come on over to Psalms 132, and you see it again here as we have the, come on, Psalms 132, as we have this great song of degrees, which is detailing the, the significance of the Davidic covenant. And you start there in verse 11. He says, The Lord has sworn in truth unto David. He will not turn from it. 
of the fruit of thy body will I set upon thy throne. If any children will keep my covenant and my testimony that I shall teach them, their children shall also sit upon thy throne forever more. For the Lord hath chosen Zion, he hath desired it for his habitation. This is my rest forever, and I, here will I dwell, for I have desired it. So when you come back to Luke 1, I run all that through with Psalms and so forth with Mary, because Mary, verse 56, and a Mary abode with her, with Elizabeth, about three months, and returned to her, her own house. Mary understood where she was. She understood what God was doing with the Lord Jesus Christ, with Jesus. They're going to call his name Jesus, if you remember. Uh, back up, the, they, uh, um, Gabriel tells Joseph, you call his name Jesus. She understood what God was going to, and the fact that he was going to fulfill the Abrahamic covenant. Mary understood that. And again, she was a good dispensational Bible student, if you will. She understood where she was on the timeline for Israel. She knew where she was. She knew what was going on. She knew where the program of God was operating with that nation. So she's going to go home now, verse 56. So in verse 57, now Elizabeth's full time came that she should be delivered, and she brought forth a son. So John the Baptist is now born, and her neighbors and her cousins heard how the Lord had showed great mercy upon her, and they rejoiced with her. Again, just as Gabriel, back up in, in, chap, in verse 13, said, verse 13, And the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard. Thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, uh, John, Jesus. Call his name John, and they shall have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. Verse 58, that's exactly what happened. Verse 59, and it came to pass that on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child, and they called him Zacharias after the name of his father. That's normal. That's the normal case. That's the normal, that's the norms of Israel, of society in that moment. Now, we tend to do that. When my kids were born, my son is the fourth. I'm the third. He's he got my name plus the fourth. Our daughter, we put my mom's middle, she's Marie, that's her middle name, that's my mom's middle. So you tend to pass that legacy on, but they're going to call him Zacharias, but watch verse 60. And his mother answered and said, not so, but he shall be called John. Why? Because that's what Gabriel said to call him, that's what the angel said. He's, you're going to call him John, if you go back there at the end of verse 13, thou shalt call his name John, verse 61, and they said unto her, There is none of thy kindred that is called by this name. And they made signs to his father how he would have him called. They go ask Zacharias, and he's got to write it down. You know, he can't speak yet. And he asked for a writing table and wrote saying his name is John, and they marveled all. That's exactly what the angel said. Now, verse 63 is a very interesting verse. It's got some details in it. Notice that he asked for a writing table. So they're not illiterate. They're not dumb thump cavemen and how, how they picture the first century people as being all this brutes. They're not that at all. He's going to write it down. He's going to sit there and take the time to write out. His name is John. So you got well, first of all you've got the writing table so they're not illiterate they're able to write and to communicate through written word and then you've got the validation of what Zacharias now has come to understand what and believe the angel where where Mary just believed and said let it be be it unto me according to thy word Zacharias was questioning it and questioning what's going on so that's why he's dumb. So verse 63, he asked for a writing table, wrote it saying, his name is John, and they marveled all. And his mouth was opened immediately, and his tongue loosed, and he spake and praised God. Now he can speak. Now he's going to be able to express 
what for nine months he'd been writing down. <laughs> okay? Now he's going to verbally express it. He's, he's been, I, I mean, you, you know, you think about this, you got this, he's been putting it all together, and his mouth is open. Verse 65. And fear came on all that dwelt round about them. And all those sayings were noised abroad throughout all the hill country of Judea. And all they that heard them laid them up in their hearts, saying, What manner of child shall this be? And the hand of the Lord was with him. Now that's a very poignant moment there. Big news. Everybody's heard about it. Everybody has heard that Zacharias came out and couldn't speak. Everybody's got that news. And for nine months, he hadn't been able to say a word. He confirms that the child's name is going to be John. And now he can speak and he praises God and he's going to let her fly here in verse 67 and following. But before we do that, notice in verse 66, what, what manner of child shall this be? Well, verse 15 for he, the angel, Gabriel said, For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. Verse 17, And he shall go before him in spirit and power of Elias. Obviously, he's going to be something special. Okay, and we looked through all that when we went through there about the spirit of Elias, Elijah and so forth. But now in verse 66, he says, hey, he's, gonna, he's a special child. Everybody knew this. But then he, the way that verse ends, and the hand of the Lord was with him. Now, that's a special term in Israel's program. And it's, gonna, it's, it's, re, it's referencing a special direct intervention by God into human events, into human history. And if you come back to 1 Kings chapter 17, we see that with John's namesake, if you will, who he's coming in the power of, and that's Elijah. 1 Kings 17, I'm sorry, 1 Kings 17. Okay? 1 Kings 17, by the way, verse 1, and Elijah... the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there, stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. Elijah just showed up out of the blue. He's not in Scripture until right here. Bam. Guess what? John the Baptist just shows up out of the blue. Bam, he's there. There's no, there's, he got nine months of a, he got a nine month pre warning, he's coming, but in Israel's history, we've had 400 years of silence, and now the, the silence is broken. Gabriel comes, gives a message that the, the, the messenger, the crier in the wilderness is here now, and wham. Now come over to chapter 18. Chapter 18 of 1 Kings. And look, if you will, at verse 46. And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he girded up his loins and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. You see how the hand of the Lord, there's a special direct intervention from God in the nation of Israel's life through the ministry of Elijah. And you know what he did in chapter 18. He calls the Baal guys together, and he mocks them, and they have, he, he, uh, verse 21, he asks that great question, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him, but if Baal, then follow him. The people answered him, Not a word. And then he gets into it with them. Verse 38, The fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offerings. Why? The hand of the Lord is on him. See, he goes up then in chapter 19, he's on Horeb, he thinks he's all alone, and the Lord says, no, they haven't, they haven't bowed. By the way, in chapter 17, he says there's no, no rain going to happen 
Then three years, three and a half years later, there's rain that comes. You have Elijah uh, raising the widow's son. You have him doing a whole bunch of things. Why? Because the hand of the Lord was on Elijah. So when you come back to Luke 1, here is John the Baptist. He comes in the spirit and power of Elijah, a, a picture of of God is doing something new now in Israel. And God directly reaches in and He's doing something and He's intervening in Israel's history. And there's a directness here. And He does it through Elijah, and now He's going to do it through John the Baptist. You come back to Luke, uh, look over at Luke 16. So when you come through your Old Testament, and you come out of Malachi, which, by the way, is the last book of a Gentile Bible. The last book of the Hebrew Bible is Second Chronicles. But when you come in from Malachi, you got that break in time. And then in Matthew, here's the announcement. And Luke 16, 16 helps with that. Understanding that God is doing something new now. That it's the next step in Israel's program. Luke 16, 16, the law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached, and every man presseth into it. You see, with John the Baptist, with his birth, with, with the announcement here, and then the birth, now what are we preaching? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Until Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, until Matthew... So that announcement of John the Baptist, the law and the prophets were the issue. And literally what verse 16 does is it capsulizes, it cap, uh, capsulizes the whole of John the Baptist's ministry. Here's what it is. The law and the prophets were until John. Again, remember, the Lord says, I didn't come to, to uh, tear down the law or destroy the law. I came to fulfill it. And the prophets... But we're preaching since that time, the kingdom of God is preached. With John the Baptist now, God is bringing something new here onto the scene. He's, it's the next step in the progression of Israel's history. They've had the law given to them. They've had the prophets tell them, hey, you need to pay attention here. This is what's going to happen and so forth. And now they're not getting it, so now it's the next step. And literally what's happening here, if you go back to chapter 1, is with John the Baptist, God establishes a Jewish Baptist church, if you will. The door into that church was opened by the porter. That's John the Baptist. The door is water baptism. And as we go through Luke and as we've studied in our, in our John studies, we saw that. So the hand of the Lord, there's something new happening here. There's an advancement in the program. First of all, it took a miracle for Zacharias and Elizabeth to have John. Okay? Now it took, and by the way, that miracle is like Abraham and Sarah having Isaac. There, there, the human activity was involved of the husband and the wife. With Mary, there's no husband. That's a supernatural situation. So when you come into Luke 1 here, that verse 66 sometimes just gets read through. What manner of child shall this be? And then his father, and they miss that hand of the Lord. There's a trigger there. He's coming in the power, in the spirit and power of Elijah, just as Elijah was used to by God to introduce a new situation. Now John the Baptist is as well. So verse 67, and his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied. Notice, say, he prophesied. There's something going to happen here. Now, if you look here at verse 15, <clears throat> just no, notice something here. Verse 15, For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. Look down at verse 41. 
And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. Verse 67, and his father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Ghost. You see, it's a whole family thing here. They're all filled with the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost was given to him, which is now going to give him, you've been writing all this down, now let's go preach it. And let's, this, in other words, the silence of God has been broken. Okay, so what does he do? Verse 68, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people. Fantastic. Here it comes. By the way, again, <laughs> go back to Psalms. We're not going to do this with Zacharias, but, and by the way, he's a priest. Psalms 106 and verse 48, Psalms 106 and verse 48, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting, and let all the people say, Amen. Praise ye the Lord. There he is. He, blessed be the Lord God of Israel. Who is that? Well, he's, he's everlasting to everlasting. He's always, he's the one. He hath visited and redeemed his people. What is Mary is told to Mary, he shall save his people from their sin. But the, but the redeeming here, it starts with John the Baptist showing up and making that announcement of make way the straight. Here comes, here he comes. Here comes the Messiah. Verse 68, verse 69, sorry, and hath raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Isn't that interesting? You run back to Psalms again. Psalms 132. I guess we'll do this as we can. Psalms 132. So you have to remember, these guys were not Bible thumpheads, <laughs> dumbbells. They understood this. Psalms 132, if you look there at verse 17, There will I make the horn of David the bud. I have ordained a lamp for mine anointed. Well, who's the anointed one? That's the, that's the Lord, Jesus Christ. He's Luke 1, verse 69, And hath raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of David, the house of his servant David, a house of salvation. Again, that's what that horn of David. Verse 70, Luke 1, verse 70. As he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began. Now, that's a great country. It's very fascinating, stuck right in the middle of Zacharias as he lays out this great dispensational thing that we use compared with Romans 16, 25, and 26, where he says, we, in The preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret. We talked about that this morning. Kept deliberately kept secret but now is made manifest kept secret since kept secret <laughs> i lost it since the world began you go over there to acts chapter 3 verse 21 where peter talks about again spoken since the world began but here is zacharias and what is he saying well by the mouth of his holy prophets which have been since the world began that when we we that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us. And that's going to drag us back to that Psalms 83 and that 10 confederate nation that sign on with the Antichrist, whose goal, Psalms 83, verse 4, is to annihilate and do away with Israel. He says, Hey, there's a horn of salvation, there's a there's a house of salvation over there coming out of David. My son's going to pre-announce him, and he's going to come. And when he comes, he's going to save us from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us. Verse 72, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he sware to our father Abraham. Now, come back to Psalms 105. Psalms 105. And that's exactly what David says he's going to do. 
And we, we read that earlier, didn't we? Psalms 105. Yes, we did. Okay? Psalms 105, the first 11 verses. But in verse 9, which covenant he made with Abraham and his oath unto Isaac and to confirm the same unto Jacob for a law unto Israel for an everlasting covenant, saying, Unto thee will I give the land of Canaan the lot of your inheritance. And that's, again, off he goes. So when you come back here to Luke 1, what's the Messiah going to do? Verse 74, that he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear and holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. This is what the Messiah is coming to do. Verse 71 to 75, here's what Messiah is going to do. My son's announcing him and this little baby that's going to be born over here with Mary is going to be the one. Then he says in verse 75, I'm sorry, verse 76, And thou, child, and thou, child, shalt be called the prophet of the highest. Now he's going to turn and he's going to look at John the Baptist. Here's what my son is come to do. Here's the adoration of the Savior. He's coming. Got three months. Here he comes. Six months, sorry, not three months. Six months. Here he comes. And then he turns and he says, and thou, child, he looks at John. And from 76 down to verse 80, this is what the, the messenger, this is what John the Baptist is come to do. Shall be called the prophet of the highest. So what is John the Baptist? Well, he's a priest, but he's also a prophet. He's come to, to do that. Then he says, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his way. That's what we're doing. That's what he's doing. Then he says, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remissions of their sins. That's what he's doing. He's going to do that. He's going to come in and he's going to work down through and he's going to come over. And he's going to step right in there, and this is what he's doing. Verse 78. Thou, uh, I'm sorry, through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us. Isn't that interesting? The day spring. Uh, if you come back to, to Malachi chapter 4, that issue of the day spring, that, that's a reference to the sun rising. But not just any sun rising. If you look there at Malachi 4 and verse number 2. But unto you that fear my name shall the sun, capital S, U-N, of righteousness arise with healing in his wings. And ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. And ye shall tread down the wicked. There they are. For they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. By the way, when's he going to do this? Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. So there's, the, there's Moses. By the way, Deuteronomy 18, he's called that prophet. Then he says in verse 5, Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet before the coming of, and of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Right? This is judgment. It's coming. And who shows up? Here's John. Here's OJB. Here's John the Baptist. And what's he going to do? He's announcing the Savior, the Redeemer, the Messiah. Here he is. And in verse 48, whereby the day spring, that son of righteousness with healing in his wings is going to rise. Verse 49, to give light, Luke 1. Do what? Luke 1, 79, yes. To give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit. Again, that goes back to verse 17. That spirit and power of Elias and that issue of the Holy Spirit there, and was in the deserts till the day of his showing unto Israel. And that's going to end up being over in, uh, in, in actually in Luke, it's in Luke 3. But notice in verse 79, to give light to them 
that sat in darkness. If you come back to Isaiah chapter 8. Isaiah 8. Isaiah 8. I didn't think we'd get down through all these verses, but we're doing okay. (laughs) It's pretty straightforward, but Isaiah 8, if you look at verse 19. And when they shall say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits and under wizards that peep and that mutter. Should not a people seek unto their God for the living to the dead, to the law and to the testimony? If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. And they shall pass through it heartily bestead and hungry. And it shall come to pass that when they shall be hungry, they shall fret themselves and curse their king and their God and look upward. And they shall look unto the earth and be troubled and darkness, dimness of anguish, and they shall be driven to darkness. Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation. And chapter 9 gets into the last days, chapter 8. Here's the Antichrist, and as he's going to come up, and he's going to get them. Verse 12, say, say ye not a confederacy to all them to whom this people shall say a confederacy, neither fear ye their fear, nor be afraid. That's that issue of Psalms 83, those ten nations that hate them, that come up against them. And what are they going to do? They're driven to darkness, that fifth course of judgment. They're driven out there. No spiritual life. No spiritual light. Verse Chapter 9, verse 1, Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation, when at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulon and the land of Nephilim, and afterward did more grievously affect her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan and Galilee of the nations. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. Now that's the prophecy. Now walk, come back over on your way back to Luke. Stop in Matthew 4. Matthew 4. In Matthew 4, John the Baptist has just been thrown in prison. Verse 12. Matthew 4, verse 12. And when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee. So he leaves to go into Galilee in Matthew 4. By the way, in Matthew 19, he leaves Galilee to come back to Jerusalem. So from Matthew 4 to Matthew 19, he's up in Galilee. But watch, verse 13. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum. Capernaum becomes his hometown his operation, base headquarters, which is upon the seacoast in the borders of Zebulon and Nephilim, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, so Isaiah 9, 1 and 2, the land of Zebulon and the land of Nephilim, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. By the way, in Isaiah it says Galilee of the nations. If I I just had a brain... Paul, yeah, Galilee of the nations. That's how you know nations and Gentiles are interchangeable. The people which sat in darkness, verse 16, saw great light. And to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then you see in verse 18 and following, he it gets up there, and the next thing you know, he's got, he, he sees Uh, Simon called Peter and Andrew, and then he sees James and John. And the next thing you know, he begins to collect up the little flock. But where is he collecting it up? He's collecting it up from this group of people who sat in darkness. So down in in back in Luke 1, verse 79, what Zacharias is saying is John is the one who's going to point to the light. Zacharias understood that the ministry of John was going to be to introduce the Messiah to Israel and to point and say, there's the light that Isaiah said was coming. There's the day spring. He's the one 
preferred before me. He's the one that should be ready to go. He's it, guys. There he is. Okay? Then in verse 80, the child grew and waxed strong in spirit. Again, the spirit and power of Elijah. And was in the deserts till the day of his showing unto Israel. Now, that's kind of key. He's not in the temple. Zacharias and Elizabeth were Levites. They were priests. She was the daughter of Aaron. You would think they were there, but he's not. He's outside of the temple. He's out in the desert. He's outside of the city. He's hidden away. Okay? Now, come back to 1 Kings 17, where we were just a minute ago with Elijah. 17.1, actually, get 18. Elijah just shows up. Okay? 1 Kings 18.1. This is going to go with chapter 17, 1, 2, and 3 here. Actually, if you look at 1 Kings 17, because in Luke 1.80, until he said he was in the deserts till the day of his showing unto Israel. Well, 1 Kings 17, verse 1. Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. He just shows up. Verse 2, And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith, that is, before Jordan. Now go over to chapter 18 and look at verse 1. And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go show thyself unto Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. And Elijah went up, went to show himself unto Ahab, and there was a sore famine in Samaria. What happened? Elijah just shows up, but then the Lord tells him to hide, no rain, can't find Elijah to fix it. And then what does he say, 18.1? Now go show yourself. So what does John the Baptist do, coming back to Luke 1? He does exactly the same thing. He goes out, hides in the desert. He's outside. He's hidden away. Nobody can find him until it's time to come and to show himself. And that issue of him coming and showing himself, why? Because now it's what? It's time for the Messiah to be born, which is what chapter 2 is going to do the birth of Christ. And then in chapter 3, chapter 3 of Luke, verse 1, now in the 15th year of, so we got some time passing by. By the way, in Luke 1, 2, we find the Lord at 12 years of age. Okay? <clears throat> we find Him with His parents there in the temple back and forth. He goes home. Now we jump forward some years. And now who's going to now what happens? Now we've got John out saying, "Hey, it's time and I'm in Luke 3 verse 3 and it came to and he came, he John the son of Zacharias in the wilderness and he came into all the country about Jordan preaching the baptism of repentance for the remissions of sins as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And off he goes. And what happens there literally is in Luke 1 and 2, we see the scene gets set. And in Luke 3, here's John, shows up out of nowhere, preaching. Here he comes. Time to get ready. It's time to repent and get on, get on board. The time's at hand. So just... So in Luke 1, you have tremendous information flowing through here that no one, that Luke went and validated, verified the witness accounts, talked to people. He went and interviewed Mary. By the way, in chapter 2, if you look at verse 19, but Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. She didn't really tell people about all of this. She told Dr. Luke. He, he, gets, he verifies it, verifies the accounts, and goes over and talks to Elizabeth and Zacharias, verifies their accounts, what happened, this and that. 
And then John the Baptist is now born. Chapter 2, we'll get into that next time. We'll see the Lord's birth. And again, it's not December. It's late September, not late December. So a tremendous amount of information. But what I want you to catch in from verse 46 to the end is that Mary and Elizabeth and Zacharias were all Bible believers. They understood where they were on the timeline. They understood the importance of John. They understood the importance of Jesus. They, they knew what was going on. They weren't walking around, you know, blind, going, oh, feely. They had writing, writing they were, weren't illiterate. They had the Bible. They understood their Old Testament. And now it's time to bring in something new. So God gets involved in the human history, the events of intervening in human history, and He does that. And with the birth of John, Zacharias first sings adoration to the Savior. And then he turns to his son and says, this is what my boy's going to do. And then he brings all that out in clear evidence so that when the nation was to look at John, he's out beyond Jordan, he's outside of the city, he should have been in the city. Why? He's not, apostasy. He's outside. The Pharisees and Sadducees come up, he calls them, you viper, you generation of vipers. You know, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? By the way, that phrase, to come, it's coined by, by John, used by John. And he gets into it with them, and we'll get into all that as we go through. Okay? Just, I want you to just catch the feel of what these folks knew and understood. And it goes against a lot of what is generally taught about the folks in this time period. When we get over and we see Philip and we see Andrew and we see Nathaniel, we see these guys, it's Nathaniel. I'm sorry, it's, it's Andrew that goes to Peter and says, we have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. It's Nathaniel that comes up and says, you know, wait a second, are you really Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph? It's Nathaniel who gets in there. He gets into the weeds about Moses and the law and the prophets and all that. They, are, is that really you? And the Lord looks at Nathaniel and says, behold, an Israelite indeed in whom is no guile. And Nathanael answered and said, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. You see, so it's these guys, they're not walking around going, you know, where is everything? They're Bible students, and they understand the timing. And that's really kind of what I'd like you to get the feel of here, because a lot of times when we get into this, people have weird ideas about it, okay? All right, dearly Father, we thank you for the evening, Lord. We thank you for the Gospel of Luke. We thank you for your word and the ability to look into it and to study it and to see the wonderful uh, message that you have in it. We'll give you the praise and the glory. In your name we pray. Amen.